So we buy a lot of crap that we don't need. And we probably have everything we need in the attic, but we're afraid to fix it. And that's why I want to introduce you to Peter Mui. We had him on the Ralph Nader show, and he is Mr. Fix-It. He is, I believe he's an MIT guy, and he's an engineer. He's also the uh, administrator of the Fix-It Clinic. For more information, go to fixitclinic.blogspot.com. Welcome, Peter. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back. Fixing things. We throw everything out. When I, when I, I'm ashamed to tell you when, when, how bad an example I was to my children. Something broke. I, I just did, you know what? I did it yesterday. A coffee cup that I've had for 20 years. The handle broke and I went, gone. And I threw it out because it no longer sparked joy. I could have gotten crazy glue and put it together, but I thought, I'll do what Marie Kondo says. Just, you know, doesn't spark joy, throw it out. Uh, do we, we don't need anything, do we? we? Everything we need, we already have. Well, let's back up to your coffee mug. So what if it had had greater provenance for you? What if that had been your father's favorite coffee mug and you had memories of it as a child? You know, that somehow it was imbued with something more than you're just dismissing, well, it's broken, I forgot a dozen other coffee mugs, I'm gonna throw it out. What, is there a threshold at which you would have accepted that you would have wanted to try to keep that around or keep the pieces even? You know, that, that it was so precious that you wanted to sort of, and I'm, 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 I'm riffing on that because the Japanese have the ancient Japanese art of kintsugi, which is ceramic repair. And the, they repair it with this fine gold. I don't know if you've seen it, you know, it's really beautiful what they do, but the repair piece is considered to be more valuable and more beautiful than the original. So you, I'm just, I'm just curious. So you, you take something that was broken, that was once and, beautiful. And you illustrate the repair. And so it's imbued with the, with right. the values of the repairer as well at some level. But, but each, each right. repair has a story and a visible story. It's kind of like visible mending on clothing is popular now as well. That, that rather than trying to hide the patch, you, you, you make the patch very, very visible. And we're right. wearing these things that are just, you know, ta- you know, pieces and pieces of fabric all over the place. But, but to your, like, what would have, what, what would have taken, what, what cup or what thing in your life would you have broken and said, you know, I want to still keep this or I want to still keep well, it. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I have uh, uh, some, I have some coffee mugs from late night with Conan O'Brien and some coffee mugs from the Ralph Nader museum in Winstead, Connecticut. If, if, if they broke, I'm like that with shirts, frayed collars. I drove some loved ones crazy because the more frayed the collars got, the more I enjoyed them. I remember my grandmother, would flip the collars for me i would take them i go to the bronx and she would flip my collars and people said what do you do like they would call me cheap and and i would say this is a shirt that's 10 years old it's 100 percent cotton it feels great it feels even better that after 10 years i could can still wear it people hate me for many reasons but people it, it, it stirred up real vitriol from certain people who said, throw this out. Hmm. So, you know, well, uh, well, trust that maybe it said <laughs> more about you, them it, than it, it said it, about you. One I'll thing you can't you. fix is the show. That's one thing, well, Peter. Yeah, it's a- <laughs> you can't fix my personality. Look, look, we all, we all want to, to have, look, jeez. Uh, I heard this quote once I got a lot, which says, style is originality, fashion is fascism. And so, right. you know, we, we, why do we put on clothes when it's, when it, for any other reason than to stay warm when it's cold outside? Okay, there's, there's part of how it's an expression of us to the rest of the world. I mean, I put on this collared shirt before, I took off my t-shirt 15 minutes before I got on the show because I didn't want to look frumpy, you know? So, so, so what, tell me about your fix-it clinics. You do this on Zoom. People gather 
And you well, give we do advice? It any number of ways now. So originally it was in-person events, you know, and, right. and obviously once the pandemic starts, you can't do that anymore. So then we transitioned to Zoom and then recently we've added Discord. So we have this global fixer server on Discord and for your viewers who, or readers or listeners who are not familiar, that's a gaming platform that's very popular with teens and young adults. Mm -hmm. And we've repurposed it for repair. And we've got right. global fixers around the world participating there, fixing stuff 24 seven around the world, around the clock. What's what's going on in our, in our public schools? Because it, it seems to me they say teach STEM so our children can compete with the world. So they teach science, right? Technology, engineering, but they cut back on shop. They cut back on auto repair. Is it, you, you went to MIT? Yep. It is conceivable that you can graduate from MIT with not knowing how to fix a car? Is that conceivable? Yeah. Well, even, okay, 20 years ago, the Dean of Engineering came out here to Northern California to talk to us about the state of the incoming students, okay? And he was lamenting, or I shouldn't, maybe it wasn't lamenting, but he made an observation that they knew how to program. So if it, this was the electrical engineering dean, you know, dean of engineering, electrical engineering background. They knew how to program, they knew what a computer was, but they had never like changed a card inside a computer. They had never touched a soldering iron. You know, I have programmer friends today who feel that every programmer should understand what a transistor is and how it works, because at the core of it, that's what makes the darn thing work. Now, we have a complicated world and there's lots of layers of abstraction. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, look, you can graduate from medical school without taking a single class in diet and nutrition. So there's all sorts of places where we cut corners you know, in, in, in education. I, I've tried to go to a very core thing. What I'm really trying to do is convey basic critical thinking and troubleshooting skills. And I'm just using people's think broken stuff as their excuse to get them in the door. And, right. and they're usually highly motivated to get the thing repaired because it has some provenance to them beyond the item. And, you know, we can go into this, but repairing at this point is largely a middle class and upper middle class phenomenon. It's not something repairing that- is Repairing is a upper middle class phenomenon. Well, well, you have it, it. It's more expensive to repair. So right now, our, our our relationship with durable goods is wired so that it's cheaper to just buy a new one than to put into the risk, add the risk in the other components of trying to get the thing that you have currently repaired. And for for meaningful, like you don't know how much time it's going to take. You don't know if the repair will actually take. You don't know if it will work afterwards you know and, and and the repair people are very expensive if you can find them at all so tell me about the repair laws that have just been passed well none have passed yet <laughs> so but they're in the process and uh, of course the manufacturers are fighting this tooth and nail but didn't uh, apple open up its system so you could repair it no yeah. apple has said they will make certain repair parts available to end consumers but the products are designed in a way that you can only get those parts from Apple and they can only work in your specific device. Right now with the latest iPhone 13, my understanding is if you go to the Apple store on Fifth Avenue, buy two brand new iPhone 13s, put them down in front of you, take them apart, take one part out of each and swap them and put them back together, neither phone will work because the internal components are serialized to that specific phone. So what Apple is offering to consumers right now, and you know, we're, we think it's pretty lame, that basically they're saying, if your phone breaks, you tell us, we know what phone you own, we send you a properly serialized part to install on it, good luck. And, and part of their hope is they've also made the thing so complicated to repair, you'll probably break it in the process, your average right. person. So, so th there's, no, there's, no party, there's no third party repair possible in that sort of an ecosystem. In so. their defense, uh, not to defend Apple, but I, can you understand everything you buy from Apple breaks and you have to take it in and you need help. If you start fidgeting with the product, 
it's going to be a nightmare for their geniuses. Isn't it easier to say, you know what? It's not working. It's under the warranty. Give us the old phone. Here's a brand new one. We'll refurbish this and then sell it to somebody else. Isn't isn't I mean, that's not well, bad. Whoa, whoa, for the whoa, whoa. So there's a lot of presumptions in that last little okay. uh, statement here. So let's see. This is like the challenge I have. There's this idea of extended producer responsibility that the, and the, the manufacturers are claiming we'll take cradle to grave ownership of our item. You know, so the Apple's claiming that they will, if you recycle the item with them, they will properly demanufacture it into it into parts and send everything back to be remade into more iPhones. First of all, Apple produces so many millions or billions of devices, there's no possible way they can get them all back to properly dispose of them. Second of all, it encourages product churn. So yes, of course, they get you on this two-year warranty thing. So every two years, you have to change your phone. What if you like your phone? What if your phone does fine for you? I mean, some of the older phones were more, a lot more durable. I'm, not, I'm packing some old iPhones here that are smaller. They're, they have features that I like. Um, but, but I don't get to choose. Apple one day says, oh, we're no longer going to provide software updates for your phone. Too bad. You're going to either end up with security vulnerability or you have to buy an, our, our latest, greatest phone. We'll give you a discount, by the way, and we'll take your old phone and tell you we're going to demanufacture it properly. And so people, do, people say, eh, OK, I'll go. You know, what the hey? How does uh, not having the right to repair chill innovation? Well, it's, it's about the, the protections that people put. It's about innovation occurs but it's under it's under the radar because people are using intellectual property rights and most notoriously in the united states copyright law to keep people from innovating on their devices right and so that it's um, without going to fries i understand fries is no longer in business but there's a famous fry i used to visit fries in silicon valley not knowing anything, but I knew I was walking through the same aisles that Steve Wozniak walked through when he built the first or second, at least the second Apple. Where do you go if you want to tinker in your garage and build the next Apple computer? Do they still have stores like Fry's? There are fewer and fewer of them, and it's mostly online which might be okay. So there's there's companies like DigiKey and Mouser and Our Electronics that sell you individual components like that. So yeah, I mean they're there. You can you Do can we have I mean, you have you have your Fixit clinic and people should go to fixitclinic.blogspot.com to find out how It's easier. Can... It's fixitclinic.org it routes to that. So they don't even have to oh, remember I'm the whole serious. blog spot. Booty, booty. Uh, Wozniak benefited from uh computer clubs right there was a teacher people would gather didn't he unveil the first apple in front of other uh right, computer the computer club in, in down in the south bay here in northern california right. yeah so well there are well, maker spaces now there's a big one called circuit launch in uh, oakland california that that tries to be a mini shenzhen aspires to be like a robotics hub I, I'm a little bit jaded because I live in Northern California, so we have all sorts of frenetic activity here, you know, around cutting edge technology. I'd like to see more of that happen in other places, not just in the United States, but in the world. Yeah. You know, I listened to the first hour, you know, and, and I was thinking that we should try to like, I mean, that's a big elephant in the room. I, I mean, I know we've transitioned, but you know, you think about um, what we did with Taiwan is we gave them the process knowledge. In the United States, what we start to do, when we demanufactured the United States, when we stopped moving manufacturing jobs overseas, what we forgot was that how someone makes it specifically makes a big difference. You know, how that, that knowledge of how you actually do attach the nut to the wheel <laughs> or something or more sophisticated, you know, like in biotech, how do you do the secret shake at that last moment to, to you know, merge the last two components? That stuff got lost. That's or actually it got lost in the United States. It got transitioned to Taiwan. And that's why TMSC makes the best semiconductors in the planet. They make them in Taiwan. You know, yeah, Intel designs them here in the United States, but TMSC knows how to actually make them and make them at scale. 
And that's it's something the, that, you know, Fix the Clinic would love to return to the United States as an extension of what we do is starting to revitalize that process knowledge back here in the United States. Right. It's the difference between getting an MBA from Harvard and actually starting your own business, rolling up your sleeves. It's the difference between working for McKinsey and working for a real business. And you're saying since we've deindustrialized, Americans don't make anything anymore. So we don't know anything anymore. Well, we know some things, but we don't know the entire thing. We don't know the right. entire, you know, and, and, and there's, if you're going to be a resilient society or a resilient world, okay, forget about national borders. You really should try to know as much as you can about as much as you can. <laughs> right. And certainly the things that you depend on, the things that you rely on in your life, you should understand those things. And so to hark back to two generations ago when a car was a pretty simple device, relatively speaking, but people knew how to fix their own cars. Okay, everybody's life depends on their smartphone nowadays. People don't know how to fix their own smartphone. Right, right. What did you repair today and how many hours a day do you spend repairing things? Do you listen to podcasts, music? What do you do, books on tape? What do you do when you're repairing something? I would assume it says for you, it would be as satisfying as it is for my friend John to play baseball. It, it's complete focus and you can block out the world and you end with a sense of accomplishment. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but you know, Fix a Clinic is just my latest experiment in social engineering. And I've got a lot more other interests besides this, but I am, I, I, I'm managing more repair than I'm doing myself at this point. So between the, 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 yeah, are, well, are okay. So, so this is a part, oh, okay. So, so what we're really going for here is a moonshot. What you're really going for here is a wholesale change in the consumer mindset vis-a-vis -vis their consumption. Because the problem is this kind of product churn and this kind of disposable society we have right now, we all see it's unsustainable for the planet going forward long-term. So, so the question is, how do you think about modifying people's behavior? And like I said earlier, as long as it's cheaper to buy a new one, as long as the purchase price does not reflect the true upstream and downstream costs of the item, we're sunk. You know, right. un unless we can start to get people to be aware and, and to appreciate that. And, and so, you know, that's, that's the interesting hypothesis that I'm trying to work on with Fix a Clinic these days. Once again, I'm just using their broken thing as an excuse to, as a, of impetus to get them in the door. Right, right. A lot of people will say to me, why are you throwing this, uh, this out? Uh, throw this thing out and get a new one. You're not helping the planet by using this because it doesn't uh, burn uh, efficiently. Is that true? Okay, so it depends on the item and depends on how you want to factor the true carbon offset cost or however, the environmental impact of that device. So, so that argument is a corollary. What you're saying is basically, if the old device is inefficient, it always makes sense to buy a new, more efficient device to replace it. Right. Maybe, it depends what it is. You know, um, you know like, like the whole, um, what's that Energy Star thing on a major appliances, they put it on refrigerators and, and washing machines and stuff and say, this has an Energy Star rating of 10 or whatever. You know, at some level, that was just some big marketing campaign to get people to switch from their old appliances to new ones. There's a famous blog on, on the internet called, they used to last 50 years. If you just Google that, it'll come up as one of the top hits. And it's this guy who works in repair of white goods, who basically says, you know, the metal's thinner, the paint they use is thinner, they don't use a rust anti-rust coat on the washing machines anymore, and the old washing machines will last forever Whereas a new washing machine really will die within five to 10 years, if nothing else, just because it's not that well made. Is it planned obsolescence or just laziness and sloppiness? I think it's, I think, well, so I'm not going to give us a break on this one, okay? I think what happens is that, first of all, no, no brand or very few brands make their own devices anymore, all right? So they go to contract manufacturers overseas. And so let's say I'm, uh, um, you know, big washing machine brand A. I go to various manufacturers around the planet and I say, 
I want you to make me a washing machine that I can retail for $500. That means you got to make it for me for $250 or whatever, $100, okay? And then, and then, and so the, the guy wants the business. So it's like, okay, I'll try to figure out how to make it for a hundred bucks, right? And then they might take that to the next guy down the road and say, can you make it for 99 bucks? <laughs> you know? And so we're in this downward spiral of basically, and it's, and it's being driven by us because they think we're, we're totally price driven. We're totally price conscious, all right? So our experience, one of our learnings at Fix a Clinic is that you can spend, you know, anywhere between $5 and $500 for a toaster. And honestly, they both have the same failure modes. There's no, right. there's no good correlation between quality durability and ultimate durability and, and the price purchase price that you pay at the moment to purchase. Right. So when is your next Zoom event? Ah, March 12th out of Lund, Sweden, but they're global. Anybody can participate on any of them. Out of Anywhere Sweden? Well, out of Lund University. So, uh, yes. I'm going to be here in Berkeley. I mean, it doesn't matter with Zoom. It can be hosted anywhere. I could host it but out of this room, you, but, but, but people like to travel around the planet via by, by Zoom. They like it. Right. So, but you'll be there. I'll be there in spirit. I mean, I'll be there in electrons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How can people, uh, you know, what would be fun to do if you have time is to fix something as the show, like to, to have you fix something in the background. While yeah, we're no, 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 no. So look, the, one of the, one, we have a 70% successful re repair rate, but part of that is because the person who owns the item is actually there and can give us the provenance and can tell us, yeah, the microwave doesn't work at all now, but you know, a few months ago, I noticed if I press this corner of the door in, it'll work. That tells us everything we need in order to know what the what the repair problem is. Okay, if we were like Goodwill or Salvation Army with a pile of e-waste behind the back door and tried to figure out how to fix stuff, we wouldn't do nearly as good a job. And remember, though, we're doing this without any access to service manuals, repair you know, diagnostic tools, anything from the manufacturer, no net at all, just applying critical thinking and troubleshooting skills to whatever we're presented with that day. Is it safe to repair a microwave? If you know what you're doing, we, we try to be very, very <laughs> careful. No, well, so that's so, 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 I, so this speaks to the broader thesis about why, how can these things be manufactured so they can be user serviceable in a safe way? So, right. so, and, and honestly, so a lot of microwaves fail because there's a fuse on top that blows. The fuse is nowhere near the high voltage stuff on the side of the microwave. So, if we think somebody knows what they're doing, you know, we'll proceed. But of course, if someone shows any hesitation, we're like, don't, you can't, you shouldn't be trying to repair this, basically. Right. And what kind of tool belt do you need? I mean, do you, do you need? Oh, I've got a list. <laughs> so there's tools you need for troubleshooting. There's tools you need for diagnosis. There's tools you need to actually affect the repair. And anyone who wants to start a local fix a clinic there, I've got a list that they can they can get to sort of see how that goes. The problem that's happening now is because of this combination of hardware and software, like we alluded to with Apple serializing the internal parts, just being able to repair it mechanically or electronically is no longer sufficient. You, you, we don't have that. We won't very soon if we don't do something about, you know, about our right to be able to repair stuff that we ostensibly own. We're going to end up in a situation where we're going to be enthralled to the manufacturers. They're already using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that same law that keeps you and me from pirating, you know, music and, and movies. They're applying that to their devices. Right. So, I have bought fifteen coffee makers so far in my life. Is it conceivable that at the age of twenty-two, you can buy a Mister Coffee? and leave it to your, live to a ripe old age and leave it to your children can you keep fixing one mr coffee it depends on which one honestly i mean so so the interior the internalized parts those are the things that that i think are the ones that i'm i'm curious about right now there was this thing called a capacitor it's inside power supplies and during the 1990s there was a capacitor plague the capacitor plague meant that all these computer power supplies that had capacitors in them were failing prematurely. So you, you can't blame Dell necessarily. You can't blame IBM. You have to go all the way back to some little factory overseas that's 
chomping out these capacitors, you know, thousands at an hour. And, and until we understand, so how do we make that stuff bulletproof? How do we make those individual right. components inside bulletproof? And then we'll be, then we'll be in much better shape to build on top of that. But yeah, I would love to have an heirloom coffee maker. I'd love for your great, 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 great grandchildren to be using a coffee maker that you, you know, that you left them. And, you know, they said this was on, he held up this carafe on the, on the show. <laughs> you know? Fixitclinic.org. Fixitclinic.org. And the next one is the March next Zoom. It, The next Zoom is March 12th at uh, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You know, but around the world, it's a different part of the time zone, but we all convene. And it's basically like, you know, Mythbusters meets Antiques Roadshow. What will right. we see and can we fix it? And so well, people bring their broken stuff and, you know, they talk about it. And then the fix it coaches give some suggestions to try. And then we break out into breakout rooms and everybody tries to fix. And if we don't fix it that day, they can always come back. It, it's great for the planet, great for your mental health, and you can't repair the world until you learn how to repair your coffee maker or your mug fish that mug out of the trash we can uh, super glue it back thank you peter mui and everybody go to fixitclinic.org please come back okay thanks for having me great really great thank you so much You're